Uh, I'm going to be talking about social camouflaging, or what I'll call, um, for a convenient shorthand, uh, camouflaging uh, th throughout this talk. And I'm going to structure it around a series of questions. I'm going to start off talking about what is camouflaging, uh, with that related question of how can we measure it. Um, and then ask this question, who camouflages? You know, amongst autistic people, are there some people who camouflage more, some who camouflage less? And that will, uh, part of that, uh, answering that question, will be a consideration of uh, sex and gender differences in this respect. But the question of, do autistic women, and indeed autistic girls, camouflage more than uh, autistic uh, boys and men? Why do people camouflage? is another question I'm going to uh, begin to talk about uh, today and what are the consequences of camouflaging and in a sense although this sounds like a sort of perhaps this is rather a simplistic way to put it um, I you know really the question that kind of hovers around that is to what extent is camouflaging a good or a bad thing you know what are the costs of camouflaging and what are the benefits so I'm going to be drawing quite a lot on the work of Laura Hull, who's a very talented PhD student of mine, so I just want you to know that any merits that you see in this work are probably uh, down to her and her hard work, and also this team here of people um, uh, who we've been working with. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to draw on a qualitative study that we did recently uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Professor Baron Cohen and, and his group, uh, where we collected uh, data in the form of text, of words, from 92 autistic adults using a web survey. And we analyzed those data uh, using a technique called thematic analysis, so using a systematic way of, of deriving themes from these data to address questions about the nature, the causes, and the consequences of camouflaging. And the idea here is that this is a very young field. You know, we don't know a lot about social camouflaging from a research point of view. And so it's always helpful in those situations to do qualitative work initially, if you like, to, to map the conceptual terrain. OK, what is camouflaging? Well, when I talk to autistic people about what is camouflaging, there's one word that very often finds its way into the conversation, uh, and that word is normal. Yeah? So there was this wonderful quote from the, the Hull et al. paper that in fact made it into the title when we asked people, what, is, what, you know, what does camouflaging mean to you? And somebody says, oh, it's me putting on my best normal. Yeah? And you know, that's an echo of the famous Leanne Holiday Willie book, uh, Pretending to be Normal, uh, this concept that camouflaging is about pretending to be normal. When we analysed people's data, we found that camouflaging had a couple of components. Uh, masking. So this, these are sort of behaviours that focus on hiding one's autism, uh, perhaps even developing different personas or characters to use during social situations to mask one's autism. And we also felt there was a collection of behaviours and experiences that could come under the umbrella of compensation. So developing explicit strategies to meet the social and communication gaps uh, resulting from um, an individual's autism. I'm not quite sure why the word body language has snuck in there. It's, it's not supposed to be there, so ignore it. So... Camouflaging could be as simple as somebody, let's say a, a girl who moves to secondary school and she enjoys stimming, but she notices that when she stims, some of the other kids in her class um, tease her about it uh, or think it looks odd. And so she takes a conscious decision that in future she's going to stim privately in her own home. Now that would be an example of camouflaging. Um, also, uh, concerted, effortful attempts to um, acquire, uh, if you like, characteristics of neurotypical socialising, for example, neurotypical style of using eye contact, uh, perhaps having a rule about I look in between somebody's eyes for three seconds and then I look away, or working out ways to kind of, if you like, to, to, to uh, give the impression of using a neurotypical style of eye contact or indeed of, of gesture. What we found from our data is that very often camouflaging is, is informed by mimicry, by copying others. Uh, so I remember one young woman who I, I sat down with in actually an eating disorders unit who, who was um, autistic described a time when she was in secondary school. So she just made the transition to secondary school. Um, she was uh, you know, moving into adolescence and she reported feeling really adrift, really struggling socially. And one way that she dealt with that was to identify another girl in her class who she considered to be particularly popular uh, and to copy her. 
uh, and in a really concerted, skillful and resourceful way. For example, going home, practicing her gestures in front of the mirror, um, copying her clothes, and she developed, if you like, a, a, a rule-based system, partly for socialising, partly based on the mimicry, but also a persona, a mask that she could put on in certain situations that helped her navigate those situations uh, of sort of neurotypical socialisation as an autistic person. So it's a pretty important principle of science that in order to understand something, you need to be able to measure it. Yeah, and there have been various attempts made to measure camouflaging, to measure who camouflages more and who camouflages less. Uh, and I wanted to tell you about um, a, a, an ongoing attempt that we're involved with, a questionnaire, a self-report questionnaire that we've designed, which we call the, the QCAT, uh, the, the questionnaire for the camouflaging of autistic traits. So it's self-report. It's based on our conceptualisation of camouflaging from our qualitative work. So we try to build it up from the reports of autistic people about camouflaging. If you'd like to see it, do feel free to email me and I, and I will send it to you. We're, we're, we're giving it away free. Although I, I do want to add as a proviso, the paper validating that instrument is currently under review. Yep. So you need to just be a little bit cautious. It hasn't yet been validated uh, via a process of peer review. It has 25 items. Now, it has an overall camouflaging score, but when we came to look at how the items clustered together, how they hung together, we were interested to find that actually, contrary to our initial idea that camouflaging had these two components of compensation and masking, we actually found a third, what we call factor or, or sort of cluster of items within these data, which was assimilation. So if you like, a third component to camouflaging. So compensation, here's an example of a QCAT item on compensation. I've spent time learning social skills from television shows and films and try to use these in my interactions. So that would be an example of, of compensation. Uh, a masking item. I monitor my body language or facial expressions so that I appear interested by the person I'm interacting with. And then this assimilation factor, this, this extra element of camouflaging that we, that we discovered uh, whilst working on this questionnaire, is, is about sort of forcing yourself into social interactions when you don't actually really want to be doing those social interactions or you don't want to be doing them that way. So a classic, uh, uh, the sort of the, the archetypal item of the assimilation subscale is I have to force myself to interact with people when I'm in social situations. And we've so far, our validation study, which as I said, is currently being reviewed, 350 autistic people, uh, 471 non-autistic people, all adults, um, and th there are some sort of initial promising signs that this measure is a reliable measure, it's consistent over time, uh, and, and has validity, uh, partly stemming from the fact it was based so carefully on, on our qualitative work. Who camouflages? Well... Uh, perhaps reassuringly, from the point of view of our measure, uh, it's, uh, you won't be surprised to hear that autistic people camouflage more than non-autistic people, and these are large effects. So autistic people spend a lot more time, on average, and a lot more effort um, monitoring and modifying the way they interact with people in their day-to-day -day interactions um, in order to, if you like, mask or, or manage certain social difficulties or, or inflexibility difficulties they may have. But what is crucial, and I think what is important, is that there is substantial variability amongst autistic people in how much they camouflage. So, uh, you know, if you, when, when you measure camouflaging, and people have done it in various ways, you know, we've done it using this self-report questionnaire, Meng Shuan Lai has done it using other uh, ingenious methods, and, and, and as has Frankie Happe and Lucy Livingston, you always find that there's a spread of camouflaging scores. There are some people out there who aren't doing it much, and there are some people out there who are doing it all the time. Uh, we've, we've found that autism trait severity, higher autistic traits are associated with higher levels of camouflaging. There's some evidence that uh, camouflaging is associated with having a higher IQ and also with better executive functions. But this is a, these are early days for camouflaging research and I think that's going to be a very interesting area to examine further is, is why do some people camouflage and, uh, and some don't. Now the other thing is, uh, uh, is that women, autistic women camouflage more than autistic men. Yeah? That's a pretty consistent finding. And this picture here shows the distributions of camouflaging scores for autistic women, who are in green there, and for autistic men, who are in 
blue uh, and with scores sort of higher up, you know, literally higher up that axis indicating a greater level of camouflaging. Uh, and I suppose, I, I hope that this backs up my first point which is there's tremendous variability among statistic people in how much they camouflage. You can see a spread. Um, it illustrates the fact that women camouflage more than men. But what I also hope that it illustrates is that there are plenty of autistic men out there who are camouflaging all the time. You know, I think people, women camouflage more than men and that's interesting and important and we need to understand it. But we mustn't be blind to the fact that this is a phenomenon that is relevant to the experiences of many autistic men too. So why do people camouflage? This was a question we were very interested in in our qualitative work uh, and in this rather elaborate framework that Laura came up with, some, some themes that were derived, those that are highlighted in that red box, uh, were, in, were about this question. You know, they were kind of were basically analysing the answers that when we said to people, why do you camouflage? Um, these, are an, these are a kind of summary of those data that, that we got. And there were two main types of reason that people gave. One was called assimilation, actually, and was a sort of more pragmatic motivation for camouflaging. There was something about um, a kind of need in order to be included and to rub along in neurotypical society. Many people felt uh, that they needed to camouflage for that reason, to assimilate, to kind of fit in. Uh, and then there was another, th another theme which was more about um, using camouflage to satisfy a desire to relate to people, to know and to be known, um, giving people the opportunity to, to connect and to therefore um, feel supported and safe through, through relationships. So those were two themes. Let me give you some quotes just to kind of hopefully bring those themes to life. So camouflaging helps to survive in school and college and it's important for keeping a job. Now this one when I first saw it hit me, hit me right between the eyes. Uh, why do you camouflage? I want to avoid the bullying mostly. You know, and I think that's very interesting given Simon's point. So here we have a situation where uh, you know, lots of autistic people are, are, are feeling obliged to pretend not to be autistic uh, in order to avoid uh, victimisation and threats. So I think you know, camouflaging leads us into almost a sort of political arena where we need to be thinking about prejudice, uh, uh, discrimination and, and stigma. Um, uh, and, and to see camouflaging as a kind of a way to attempt to manage imbalances in power. Um, there are also more positive reasons, and this is more about the to know and be known theme. It enables me to be with other people in a way that's relatively comfortable for me uh, and, for, and for them. Um, what are the consequences of camouflaging? So here we have this sort of intriguing question hanging over us. You know, and again, I, I like to put it in simplistic terms. Is camouflaging a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we be encouraging people to camouflage? Or should we be trying to help them not to feel they have to camouflage? And again, um, we analyse data on this and derive themes of direct relevance to that question. Uh, and those are the ones highlighted uh, in this red box here. And there were three types of, of kind of consequences to camouflaging that were identified by our participants. So the first one was a, quite a subtle one, but there was a sense that some autistic people felt that because they were camouflaging their autism and therefore not always presenting, if you like, their authentic autistic selves, that meant that st unhelpful stereotypes about autism went unchallenged. Yeah, so that was one idea that was in the data. The most commonly endorsed theme was this one called I Fall to Pieces. And that can be really summarised by the sense of the exhaustion and the effort that's involved uh, in camouflaging. And also a related phenomenon of the kind of the anxiety about getting things wrong. You know, that constant sense that, you know, am I doing this right? You know, almost life as a, a performance uh, and, and the kind of performance anxiety that, that can come with that. And then the third theme was about identity. So there was this idea that if you spend a lot of your time feeling you need to pretend to be somebody else, you know, what effect does that have on your identity development, on your, on your integrated sense of yourself uh, as a person, when there's a major disconnect between, in a sense, how you, how you experience yourself and how other people uh, experience you. So, you know, here are some quotes to illustrate that. It's exhausting. Uh, I feel the need to seek solitude so I can be myself and not have to think about how I am perceived by others. 
Um, that was someone who identified as a, a, a non-binary gender who was 30. That's what that O30 means. Um, of course, camouflaging impacts upon diagnosis. You know, it, this is partly how I got into the camouflaging field, was trying to understand this question of why are autistic females less likely to be di diagnosed in a timely manner than males? And camouflaging seems to be part of that story. And in particular, the fact that females camouflage slightly more on average than do males. There's also a sense um, voiced by some of our participants that um, the camouflaging, this constant need to kind of present in a certain uh, sort of way that, that didn't necessarily reflect the individual's true experiences and needs, got in the way of their accessing all sorts of healthcare, not just an autism diagnosis, but physical healthcare. Uh, you know, and we know uh, about the sort of physical health challenges that autistic people face and the lower life expectancy and so on. So camouflaging may well be an important phenomenon there. And then I think there's this wonderfully um, uh, sort of expressive comment on, on this whole question of identity from this person here. So she said, this 22-year-old woman said, I feel as though I've lost track of who I really am and that my actual self is floating somewhere above me like a balloon. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that the picture that emerges from this qualitative analysis um, that attempts to kind of map out important ideas to do with camouflaging is, is one that would suggest that camouflaging is, um, is, is not something to be, to be necessarily uh, encouraged and certainly not to be encouraged in a sort of un un uncritical way. Uh, and that does fit with some other findings in this sort of gr small but growing camouflaging literature. So, for example, um, uh, Meng Shuan Lai and colleagues found, uh, when they measured camouflaging using a, a, a different way to the QCAT, found that camouflaging is, is associated with depression. Interestingly, in men but not in women uh, in, in their sample, but there was a sense that those who were camouflaging more were also more likely to, uh, to experience depression. Similarly, uh, Lucy Livingston and Frankie Happe's group, uh, again measuring camouflaging it, using a kind of cognitive, uh, sort of technical way, uh, found that those who camouflaged more were more likely to experience anxiety. And given this, this issue I talked about, about the sense of camouflaging as a performance as a kind of tightrope walk, uh, it's interesting that they particularly found that they had higher levels of social anxiety, uh, the, the high camouflages or compensators as they called them. And indeed, from our uh, analyses, which again are, are, are in preparation, so I bracket that, they're not yet you know, uh, been through peer review, but we've also found, measuring camouflage using the QCAT, so using self-report, that those who reported higher levels of camouflaging also were people who reported high levels of depression, high levels of generalised anxiety, and high levels of um, social anxiety. So obviously there could be all sorts of complex relationships going on here, but at the very least these initial findings need to lead us to think critically about the expectations that are placed upon autistic people in, to pretend to be normal and the effects that those could be having. Future questions. Um, I, I think there's a very interesting question about what abilities underpin camouflaging. Um, executive function uh, is one idea, uh, a capa a reflective function, hierarchy. There's all sorts of interesting candidates, but none have, have yet been fully tested out. What's the developmental course of camouflaging? When do people start camouflaging? At what point in their development? I've often been surprised, again, I'm, I'm talking anecdotally here, I was talking to a young woman uh, recently, an autistic woman, and she said, my special interest since the age of six has been neurotypical social behaviour. Uh, I was been obsessed with it, and I'm, and I'm you know, trying to learn it, and I've met, you know, so, so that started very young for her. You know, very young. young that's why the, the comments sort of jumped out at me and, and surprised me. Um, should we be encouraging camouflaging? You know, what, what, if we were to build a stronger evidence base that camouflaging can have deleterious effects on well-being and mental health, what is the status of social skills group? groups there. Uh, and I think where I suspect the debate will go is are there helpful and unhelpful ways to use camouflaging? Are there ways in which people we can learn from autistic people about what are the kind of beneficial aspects of camouflaging and what are the more harmful ones? Uh, and, 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 and I think the ideal would be to build social skills groups that were entirely driven by the insights of autistic people as to how they have navigated uh, successfully the social world in ways that, that, that haven't left them feeling uh, exhausted. So in conclusion, camouflaging is widespread amongst autistic women and amongst autistic men.
Uh, it's likely an important influence on well-being and functioning. It's driven by multiple motivators, some of which reflect discrimination against autistic people. Um, and I think you know, th that leads on very clearly from, from the last presentation. Um, it has complex outcomes, uh, conferring costs and benefits that we need to uh, understand better. And I'd just like to say thank you to, to uh, this is uh, hopefully most of the people who um, you know, have contributed to, to the ideas that I've been sharing with you today is through, through my collaborations with them. So thank you very much. <laughs>